I will turn this over to Amy Dotson for our 2015 uh, SIF Catalyst keynote address. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> So my initial idea was for all of us to wake up by singing Whitney Houston's Greatest Love of All, but I have two filmmakers here who talked me out of that, so you can thank them later. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to launch in since uh, there's lots to talk about. And at the end, I hope that, as you were saying, you know, the whole point is that this is Catalyst, and so it's a conversation. And so I look at this not really as a keynote, but really a conversation starter. So anybody familiar with this fabulous picture above? All right, and all the crazy iterations. It's called The Treachery of Images, and just as it's 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, it was painted by a Belgian surrealist named uh, René Magritte. And the picture he painted was simply of a pipe, and he had a rally cry of a skull at the bottom, for those of you who did not take French, that just says, this is not a pipe. And the paintings were an attempt to understand the impossibility of reconciling words and images and challenging the very notion of what makes a thing a thing. So. What makes a thing a thing and its creator important is how other people perceive it. But what's often not talked about is the less sexy bits, the more human stuff uh, that brought that iconic and oft copied image to life. So with every sketch and doodle and painting he made, Magritte was also trying to reconcile uh, himself and as an artist and as a human being. And he fancied himself a painting and told others that he was a painter but the truth is that for many years, he couldn't afford to buy paints. And he had to sketch in a notebook in his crappy apartment instead. He was hungry and tired, and his wife pissed off. His family and his neighbors had no idea what the hell he was doing. And some days, neither did he. But he kept at it. And after a long haul as a wallpaper maker, he procured a day job in advertising, where things were definitely things, and even sometimes symbolically or creatively manipulated, so that words and images and objects that were used to describe them take on meaning where there wasn't any before. And he wasn't altogether comfortable with the dichotomies of his ambitions and his realities that were presented. Things were definitely not going according to plan. And this all sounds very Don Draper for you Mad Men fans too, so. <laughs> and as a person who spent a lot of money and a lot of schooling to learn how to mirror the artists that came before him, including a stint making fake Picassos during most of the war. It took him 40 years, a whole lifetime, to get comfortable with his talents and to understand that the stories and the ideas that he wanted to tell through his work were influenced by his real life as much as it was through his vivid imagination. And the format through which he wanted to express them had to be heavily manipulated by him, and a new style forged with many missteps and many triumphs too. And later in life, he traveled everywhere to the US and throughout Europe in search of his tribe of fellow artists, as well as influences who he thought could validate his work. And he tried, and he failed, and he kept making work, often to delight of no one but his fellow collaborators. And even then, after success occasionally shone its light on him, he often had to part ways with those collaborators at the whims of gallerists or audience as they constantly changed. He infuriated some and inspired others, and he loved to provoke and question things, which we all know is not everyone's cup of tea. Some folks just like a pipe to be a pipe, and a painter to be a painter, and a man from Belgium to just stay the hell in Belgium and not travel all over the world looking for audiences to connect with, especially when there's a war going on and the world is constantly changing around them. And they still said he was no Picasso. But so what? A hundred years later, here we are on a Saturday morning talking about him, and the same questions are driving us, and driving us crazy. Who are we as artists? How can I explain my deep and real need to tell stories? How can I get anybody to care? Where do I put all these ideas? And will my day job and my home life and the choices I make help me as an artist or bring me down? The approach I suggest isn't radical, or maybe it is, depending on your point of view. But lately what I'm telling the artists that I'm working with is this. You are not a filmmaker. Labeling things, staying within the reasonable expectations of others, following the set path, and asking artists to color within the lines or struggles that have been around throughout the lifetimes of our great grandparents and certainly for many moons before that. There are even templates for keynotes and reading through the preparation for today, I was intimidated as hell. Seasoned execs, talented filmmakers, renegade voices, all with stories to tell. Why would anyone care what I had to say? So I analyzed them and I read over them, trying to figure out what type I should go with. 
Every year there's a keynote that bemoans the notion of independent cinema, the broken industry, and the gatekeepers that never let the talent shine through. There's a keynote that touts the promise of a better tomorrow, that new technologies or screens or the demise of the laser disc uh, will really usher in a new era of creativity. There's a keynote that encourages, as it is of late, is more of a sounding cry and a rally cry that it's the year of the woman, of people of color, Brooklyn or Seattle, or insert your own town is finally getting its due. And enterprising support organizations and festivals are diversifying and supporting artists in the golden age of television, shouting it from the rooftops to anyone who will pay attention. And usually it's, it's followed by a semi-helpful top 10 list of rules to follow to make these into easily shareable clickbait. And then nothing comes of it because while well-intentioned, authentic change is hard and time-consuming and the news cycle often rolls on. And right on to the creative and the positive that bring those new ideas and movements about that's sorely needed. And to the artists and industry who use their 20 minutes to address the real issues and problems facing not just our creative processes, but the world around us. Alas, Ava DuVernay, I'm not. Jill Soloway, I'm not. And Tim League, I'm not. But they are amazing human beings, aren't they? And their speeches truly move me. But by following in their giant footsteps, I'd be pretending, suggesting I know anything about creating lasting change, or have the mental math to know how Amazon's new model works, or the technical acumen to tout the greatest horror film that you'll see in your living room will next be a hologram. This talk would ring false, and uh, it would be as false as that controversial old pipe you see above me. Alas, I'm just me. I'm a 39-year-old lady with a penchant for subversive art and hair metal bands, and a pair of size seven and a half shoes that walk me to work every day and bring me home to kiss my kids at night. But I'm a woman that cares passionately and deeply and totally about the future of risk-taking storytelling. So throw out all your ideas about those preconceived notions about what makes a keynote. I don't even have a podium, so we, I think we're already there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and who gets to give one? Let's take it down a notch and just say that today is a talk. And it's a talk between me and you. And our chat is going to get back to basics about refocusing our energy on a core audience of one. And that's you. It's a conversation I've been having a lot lately. Uh, it's a more grassroots approach at dinner tables and over drinks with captains of industry and recent graduates trying to figure out a way to make meaningful work and to find a foothold. And I start again by saying, you are not a filmmaker. You can be a filmmaker, of course, but you cannot continue to singularly define yourself as such. You need to stop putting yourself in a box and to try and contain and explain your talents. And you should not let audiences and you should not let industry follow suit either. It would be a disservice to reduce Kerry Fukunaga to being just a filmmaker. Sure, he's an incredibly talented and unpredictable filmmaker who makes Spanish language and period dramas sing new tunes. But he's also an artist that makes commercials watchable and turns the whole model of television programming on its head. Ditto Dee Reese, a filmmaker who time and time again finds ways to tell her stories through docs and narrative features, but also through television and through a recently announced long-form miniseries with no less of a, a risk taker than Shonda Rhimes. I would never dream to diminish her talents. Desiree Akhavan got tired of, make to, of, of waiting to make a film and instead made a modest web series a few years ago called The Slope. It was one of the first projects that led the charge on this now fabulous online episodic filmmaking or web series or whatever you want to call it. Uh, her film then became very popular last year, uh, Appropriate Behavior. She wrote it, she directed it, she starred in it, and that snagged her a role as an actress on Lena Dunham's Girls this season. She's following this up with a foray into animation. Calling her simply a filmmaker would belittle her and her talents. And I can't take the edge off of Gillian Robespierre either. She struggled for years to get her abortion comedy off the ground. And she had a great short film in 2009 that she self-describes as having a great internet life. People really saw it on their computers and on their phones, not on the big screen. She partnered with Liz Holm, who is one of the original Catalyst speakers and a fabulous producer and interesting lady in her own right, to make the now infamous film Obvious Child. And the two are off to the races, and they're making their next project, a television series for FX, which one can only hope will continue to empower women to tell fart jokes and fully explore their complex selves. Borscht Collective makes works constantly, none of it easy to, find, to define. Led by Lucas Leva and Jillian Meyer, they have built their own festival in their hometown of Miami and garnered collaborators when others weren't cultivating their work. 
They made their own scene, directed the work they wanted to make, and showcased it in as places as diverse as museums and bar and, and barroom walls. They've now been through the Sundance Labs, and IFP is proud to host their first retrospective of work this July in New York City. But they describe themselves aptly as filmmakers with no film background who just like to invent stuff. Who knows where they'll go next? I've been lucky enough to work with all of these amazing artists, except Carrie, who I did shake his hand once. And I draw the inspiration for this chat we're having from their boundless enthusiasm and limited potential and their fierce independence in following their own paths. So then that begs the question, how do we talk about ourselves? How do we explain what we're doing and what we want to do? How do we not sound pretentious as hell when somebody asks us what we do for a living? Or when we go to a meeting at an agency at one of those water bottle things where they're asking us what, what our next project is? Or our own families around the dinner table? Storyteller, content creator, hybrid, multi-talented, entrepreneur. Maybe it's not best to label it right now because none of it feels right. There's artifice in every term. And who wants to rebrand every few years to keep up with the buzzwords of the time, or worse, just to fit in? Maybe you have a term that's right for you that suggests your openness to possibility. I'd love to hear them. Keep me posted. Tweet them. Send them to me. I'm truly fascinated to figure out how we're going to make this work. Or maybe we can work on it together. For lack of a way to put it, I'm more of a Magritte, a dreamer and a realist, a loner and a collaborator, a lover, a fighter, a builder and a breaker, a success and a failure, questioning, working, and questioning again. And I suspect you guys are too. We're all trying to find ways to embrace the ambiguity of this new era that we live in where web series and Vine videos are the new sketch pads, where mad scientists and technologists are trying to figure out the best way to create immersive experiences out of cardboards and halos full of cameras, where there are more possibilities than ever to have your verse heard if we stop buying into the myth of cinema with a capital C as the end all be all pinnacle of creative expression. And I say to that, no more. It's bringing me down, and it's bringing us down too. As individuals, artists, and audience members in industry, we have all been stuck in the same rut for far too long, particularly in holy reverence to the, cinema, uh, the contemporary American cinema. Cinema is awesome. Theaters are awesome. Communal experiences and good sound and popcorn cannot be beat or replicated. I get it. I still get the hairs on my arms standing up too. But having your voice heard often is awesome. Making work consistently is awesome. Meeting people across multiple platforms and industry that connect and inspire you is awesome. And finding new ways of sustaining your storytelling and getting paid for that work is super awesome. There's a lot of awesome in the truest sense of the word out there right now. And how can we tap into this? We have to stop with the excessive categories, boxes, genres, and color codes that mark talents for easy digestion. We have to lay off the favorites, the preferences, the likes, the sections, and the types, especially if they get us nowhere. We have to stop adjusting our realities to hold on to ways we consume stories before rather than allow new forms and ideas to take hold. We binge watch TV to make it feel more cinematic. We save up to buy $200 Beats headphones to make high maintenance sound better on our phones. None of the smart people I know can figure out if a web series or an app-based story are the minor leagues of television, or if it's its own far, uh, art form that will flourish because it has no model. And even when we as creators are in the thick of it, we spend our time as fans and followers of those who came before, and our contemporaries too. We even hire interns to help us develop our own, uh, our own fans and followers. But what we really need are the support systems and physical communities that are vital to our growth. And I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I think it's important to keep raising these questions and keep provoking. All I do know comes from my experience, both professional and personal. And my love of stories, big and small, told in a myriad of different ways, comes from a life lived both in dichotomy and boxes, and boxes that I'm still trying to unpack too. My biggest inspiration comes from my family, as I grew up in Oklahoma surrounded by a crazy, loud, amazing group of storytellers who could sit around a table with cups of coffee and slices of pie and entertain for hours. Didn't matter if they were recounting their days as cops or homemakers or journalists, talking about the plot twists of days of our lives, or regaling kids in the family with wild adventure tales replete with hats and homemade whips. The point, at the end of the long day, was to tell the damn story, not to keep it inside. 
to share it with others, even if you had to shout it over the den of a lawnmower or fight for your turn to be heard against seven other hungry kids. My grandmother's Doris Puckett. She was the heart of it all, and she could tell a story like no one you've ever met. She never made it on the front page of Variety, touting her latest deal. She never had an agent or anything wrote in, uh, that she wrote in her journals published. No one ever made a documentary about her or interviewed her for the local news, but she kept telling those stories anyway, hoping that someone would pay attention. Five feet tall, five two if you count her boof on. Her life story was one for the books, with her first child born at 17 and her last of six at 44. And very little opportunity to leave the confines of Wilburton, Oklahoma. She was a voracious reader, TV watcher, moviegoer, and supplemented her inability to travel off the dearth paths surrounding her. She lived in her imagination. Her very lifeblood was story, and if she were here today, she'd be making a story up about each and every one of you. At 75, she was finally able to break free, and with the money saved over 40 years in the hollowed out backs of teddy bears, she hopped a Greyhound bus and began to try, f travel the world and find her tribe. She was able to try on the Pope's robes at the Vatican, but she found the Italian old men too flirty. She watched her first porn at 80, and she said it was pretty much what she expected, but by God, if it wasn't a mystery. She may be the only woman in the history of the world that watched porn for plot. <laughs> she danced a Texas two-step to, to play that funky music white boy in Big Sur, California, and helped douse a hippie whose hair caught fire with her fuzzy naval cocktail. And as much as she loved now being a part of the story, she was adamant to keep up with the times and be open to hearing other stories as the years went by. She had a Facebook page, she watched True Blood religi religiously, and was overjoyed to be able to have upgraded from the Gothic no novels sold at the five and 10 to her very own Kindle, where she devoured the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy the day she got it. <laughs> Call me Amy Dolly, I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> she passed away last year at 95, and while she had no regret, she asked that we keep telling her stories and we keep them with us to tell others, to tell strangers, to tell her great grandkids, to stop every once in a while and eat some pie. And that's all we really hope for, isn't it? That the stories go on and that somebody cares enough to acknowledge them as real and complex and original, that they and you are worth it. I started working at IFP in the fall of 2006. 30 years old, couldn't have wanted anything more. I literally called the offices of Milton Tabbitt, our senior programmer, every day for six months. I finally wore him down and he hired me. I had no title, barely a job description, and about 17 responsibilities that changed daily. And I knew immediately that I wanted to stay. The organization was housed at the time in a converted dental office with all the charms that that implies. It was indie to the core, a team of scrappy, hardworking, incredibly loyal, and creative individuals working off a tiny budget to highlight filmmakers whose voices might not otherwise be heard to take risks on people and to support projects that others wouldn't. YFP wasn't like other places I worked. It wasn't even like other support organizations that had star power behind it or festivals to give them visibility or even profit sides that made sure the lights were always on. It felt real and it felt authentic, but all the same, totally unpredictable and a little wild. I was home. I loved it and I still do. And 10 years later, here I am. And I'm so grateful to Michelle Bird for hiring me and to poor Milton Tabbitt for putting up with me for all these years, and now to v Joanna Vicent, who's our current executive director and a true force of nature, for letting me stick around and learn and see what's next. So much has changed around me, but the core mission of what we do is still the same. The biggest change in our industry isn't about what you hear in the trades or on the news or those harrowing infographics that you can't even look at without a stiff shot of whiskey. They're terrifying. The biggest shift I've seen is filmmakers finally blessedly, learning to embrace the ambiguity that comes with being a creative artist. It's popping up a little everywhere, and as this is Catalyst Weekend, I'm hoping this little talk will light a spark and accelerate and amplify it all a bit. A few years ago, we at IFP got back to basics, and we worked with our creative artists to give them the tools not only to get their latest projects on the screen, but also to sustain themselves. It wasn't about the script, the financing, or the post. It was about keeping their stories going. We were tired of seeing such talented, hardworking people go into the festival circuit and out into the world without so much as a pocket knife or a toolkit to survive, and then not hearing from them again for years, maybe ever, as they crawled out from under roiling debt and dreams unfulfilled. We wanted people to break the cycle of thinking that somebody else was going to make it happen for them. 
The word people is important here as films and projects are made by individuals who dare to tell their stories out loud, but they often get lost. And so do the organizations that support them. For a while, organizations like mine couldn't wait to get their logo or laurels on posters for finished work. We jockeyed for bragging rights because the outside world, that association, that validation, was the end-all, be-all goal in ensuring that you as an organization would thrive and financially survive. But luckily, those days are gone, and we've all tried incredibly hard to work together now to support artists and each other. But still, we were hearing from artists that time and time again, filmmaking was hard and demoralizing. It took long time. They weren't making enough money to cover their rent, and they were lonely, and they were tired, and they didn't see how building a life around storytelling was possible. And of course, like Magritte, their loved ones and parents and friends, well-meaning as they were, were starting to worry what it was all for. My whole professional life, the advice I heard too was settle down, get married, have kids. You can work less. Find a steady job in development or acquisitions to follow a path on. Pick one type of work that really moves you and stick with it. Did I really want to major in welding? I did. The problem was I didn't want to choose, and neither do our artists. But it's a blessing and a curse that there's not really a one-size-fits-all path or model to point people to that reliably works. You, like Magritte or Don Draper, or even my grandma Doris Puckett, have to find your own way and adjust constantly. It doesn't happen quickly, it's not easy, and the wells of creativity that you all have to pull from for writing, directing, producing, and creating should be tapped for everything that you put your pen in your mind to. It is not about the validation of others. It's about you validating yourself. I currently have three job titles, and none of them explain what I do to my kids. No day is the same, and the projects we work on now are in film, television, web-based episodics, games, branded content, long-form journalism, installations, and my favorite, those that defy the easily, easy labeling both of themselves and their work. I'm constantly ricocheting back and forth between thinking I have things kind of figured out and not knowing what the hell I'm doing or talking about. And any industry folks who say differently to you are probably lying to you and more importantly, themselves. IFP was lucky enough after lots of late nights and emotionally taxing days to be awarded the Made in New York Media Center by IFP last year. It's 22,000 square feet in Dumbo, Brooklyn, and it's a place to make and show and discuss and support new artists 365 days a year. But it was built to address the issues of our artists and staffs faced on a daily basis, creating work both in film and outside the well-defined borders and boundaries of storytelling. We've come a long way from our days in the dentist chairs, but we still have a long, long way to go. Much of my day is now spent supporting and learning from my coworkers and colleagues, helping them find the space to curate, to create, and to question not only what's going on in IFP's programming department, but how we can support artists going into the wilds of the wider media landscape. And with artists, I spend far less time working on project development and more working with people. This means not spurts of two-day seminars or week-long workshops. It's not through the life of their project, it's through the life of their careers. Now conversations about defining their goals and understanding the risks financially, personally, and professionally that we take to make meaningful work and building a collaborative team and scaffolds to support, that isn't easy either, but they're vital and they require vast reserves of creativity. And too often these tough conversations are left for later with the excuse or the loftier goal of finishing the work and get it seen. But this is the work too. Because you are the architects of your own destinies. And if you don't make choices that support the creation and distribution of your work early and often, and the sustainability of your career, someone will make those choices for you. Or worse, no one will. So my plea is that we work together and that we make a pledge here today as people, as artists, as those creating and supporting the future of storytelling. To defy the limiting labels used to describe you and your work, but also use that freedom to carve out your own niche, your own path, and tell the stories that you want to tell, and make room for others to do the same. How? You tell me. Show us all. But I have seen a few things that are encouraging out there, and I encourage you to think about how to modify these things in your own life and art to help you reach your goals. And I hope this doesn't feel too much like the aforementioned click based top 10 list, but go with me here. <laughs> It's time to break down the barriers and preconceived notions that certain forms of storytelling are lesser than, 
more populist or lack power. That certain platforms are amateur or emerging or not viable and therefore a waste of our time. To dispel the notion that self-distribution is a lesser path reserved for those not good enough to be distributed by an established company. To encourage people that you work with and in communities that you live in to become platform agnostic when they tell stories. To question if those dusty screenplays you are writing shouldn't be modified to Snapchat or web series or games. To really understand and nurture the breadth of your talents and how they can sustain themselves creatively and financially by diversifying. To use every opportunity given to you, every festival application you write, every paragraph about the web series you created as a chance to try new things. All of those things are not homework or busy work. It's the first glimpse anyone outside your core team has to get to know you. To take a risk on young people with new ideas, older people with life experience, people smarter than you, different than you, and that these hires aren't in service to a project or defined roles necessarily, but have them by your side because they bring something interesting to the table as individuals. And if you're lucky, you'll find someone that will bring pie and coffee too. Keep pushing the boundaries and the buttons and stop making excuses. And finally, we all get caught up in life and work and the often harsh realities of being an artist. We all overthink things. But one thing that holds true no matter what path you take is being present and being grateful. Stories about the generosity and the madness that happens in this business travel very fast. And they will grease the wheels for people wanting to work with you or work against you for years to come. Simply say thank you every once in a while for what is working. Be humble, be gracious to those who support you when the good times come, and especially those who have the tough conversations late at night when you are unsure where to go next, and again, the steps you take are anything but clear. To those who have mentored you and to those who work tirelessly by your side, to those who have honored you and inspired you with their stories, to even those and especially those who said you couldn't. Remember, it's about the people, not the work. So I would be remiss in not saying thank you to the Catalyst artists here today for being brave, for being bold, for making work that clearly comes from the heart. Congratulations to the teams for Happy 40th, for Front Cover, Fourth Man Out, Circle, Chatty Caddies, and A Rising Tide. I have no doubt your beautiful films will lead to beautiful adventures ahead. And to the incredibly hardworking and big-hearted folks at the Seattle Film Festival and to the Catalyst team, thank you Carl and Beth and Brad, who put together this fantastic program together with his tireless staff. And I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge the staff of IFP2. There are 11 people, 11, <laughs> on our team. That's tiny. And they are all members of the programming department. Every coordinator, every assistant, sponsorship, and operations team, they're all deeply, deeply invested in the mission. And to my team, who none of you know, but you should, Milton Tabbitt, Zach Mandanak, Eric Lures, and Paola Matura. I am inspired to be with them every day. I appreciate their passion because their passion for artists doesn't stop. I want to acknowledge that they leave their Thanksgiving dinners to give counsel and care to filmmakers. They get in early and late to connect producers with time zones all over the world. And they stay until cloning, closing to clean up nasty vampire teeth and count chocula bowls after screenings. It's a true story. Thank you for everything. It was a total honor being here with you today, and I thank you guys all as well for listening. You plan, you build, you look forward, you tell your stories, and you hope somebody's really heard you, and then you let go. Is it all a pipe dream? Maybe, but you are not a filmmaker, and this is not a keynote. Thank you so much for listening and being here, everybody. <laughs>
just to step back, there was also a piece in there about having community um, and having um, people kind of cross collateral community, for lack of a better way to say it, of you know whether it's within Seattle, if you're from if you're Seattle based, knowing people in multiple industries, and the reason for that is that it's all starting to converge. So funny enough, a lot of my film buddies on this side of the the table are now going to work in web, uh, technology, and TV, and those are just like a couple. Right? So all these ideas that we've been thinking of, story and plot and people and characters and, and effects and all of these things are now being kind of co-opted on these sides. So you may think you have the most beautiful screenplay of all time, but somebody else, just by being inspired by the material, might think it's a television miniseries. They might be working on something similar in the gaming field or in the animation field, topically similar. And they may be able to find areas of convergence that either enhance the work that you are making as a film or make you look at it in a whole new way and collaborate on, on a different kind of thing. So I think early and often means that you are getting into these kinds of situations. You're going to other, whether it's um, markets or talks or whatever, you're just aware of what's going on in the landscape. And that you're actively, as opposed to passively reading about it or checking it out on a blog or saying, oh, that's interesting, you're actually trying to get in and be part of the conversation and figure out who those players are and hopefully when the time comes, how you can interact with them. So I think there's that. And I think the other piece is really talking to other filmmakers and artists and figuring out what distribution means to you. And to drill down on that, there's like a triangle that we always laugh about. It's like you can have love, you can have money, and you can have fame, and you can pick two. And so really understanding, not just for you personally, but the team that you're surrounding yourself with for that particular project, what is the goal? Because a producer might need to make their dentist's money back, right? Like they, they might, that might be just like the end all be all, whereas you want critical acclaim. Whereas the DP actually wants to go and shoot television because he's got three kids and he really, really, really needs this to work. And those are very disparate goals. And so really drilling down and talking to folks about what this project or what this team needs to not only like survive creatively, but survive on a, on a kind of paycheck level and on a, on a future forward level, that, that's super important. And those conversations change over time, but you should have those at the beginning, the middle, and the end, and have that conversation be evolving at all times. Does that? That's good for now. All right, cool. We'll have a beer after and we'll keep going. <laughs> Maybe not right after. <laughs> Cool. I'm just curious, are most of you guys filmmakers and artists or web series? Or who makes films in the group? OK. Who makes web series? Right on. Who makes other stuff? Like maybe, OK. Who makes other stuff even in the artistic realm? Like you're also secretly a piccolo player. OK. Or cook or anything like that. OK. And then how many folks are based outside of Seattle? Right on. OK. Do you have questions? I mean, I just feel like I know it's early, and you can have some of my coffee, but <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like I there's a lot to talk New about. It's a great question. Um, it was uh, it was a long, weird road, but I um, I wanted to go to school for what back when the dinosaurs roamed the land was called media ecology. I was obsessed with Pee Wee's Playhouse from a very young age. And I wanted to go where they made the sets. And they did. My background, as you might have picked up in the very heady, wordy conversation we just had, was, was welding. So I wanted to go someplace where I could make weird things, but also see if I could figure out why people want to make weird things and how they can succeed at doing that. So I ended up getting um, a scholarship to NYU to go to what was then called media ecology, which is now called transmedia. Um, and so it's basically if you are making multiple kinds of art, what is the ecological landscape for that, and how do those things interact? And then how do you make work from that that can sustain you? So during the, the day, I was working at the animation house where Pee Wee's Playhouse was and helping to move Cherry three inches to the left. And then I was taking classes at night. So that's what brought me there. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the best ways for you know, people who are distant from New York to connect with IFP? I mean, I, I get the email yeah. the number. Um, but so much of the programming is based in New York. So how can we develop relationships with staff so that when we submit our projects, we're a little bit more of 
unknown entity and totally. we can have conversation about them rather yep. than just being a blind submission? a great question. So first of all, we are very Midwestern slash transparent. When you pull up our website, it's our actual mugshot with our actual email underneath. So that's pretty, you know, rare. So first of all, just, just write us and just email us. And uh, I, there's two filmmakers here that you can talk to as well um, that have gone through every program I think we have. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, what's kind of unspoken is that most of our programs are outside of New York and LA, um, meaning this year's labs, please don't you know, take the tweeting off, but this year's lab selection, um, which we only pick 10 projects on the narrative side, 80% are from outside of New York and LA. Um, there's a very, you know, it's quality first, but there's a conscious choice to constantly be in touch with Brad, in touch with the, the, San, the San Francisco folks, the Austin folks, the Oklahoma folks, just to see who's out there, because we don't want the same six people getting all the cheese all the time. Um, in terms of other programming, it, it's, it's super easy um, on the film side just to reach out to us, but I think that the ones that I really love are, one again, creative. Like I've gotten a couple of creative emails this year that just make me smile. It's like, of course I'm gonna call this person back. And it's just, it feels friendly and normal and it's not about what they need. It's just like, hey, I'm me and you're you and how can we talk about this stuff? Um, and then the last thing is, I think with the Media Center, there's a lot more opportunities that even if you're in town for two weeks and you just want to immerse yourself, let's say, in learning more about how do you write for games or how do you, um, you know, figure out this financing problem that you're having where you just, you've hit up everybody you know, you've done Kickstarter, you've done these 12 things, what else can be done? Um, because it's a 365 day organization now, you can come anytime um, as opposed to just at the kind of programmatic hit points. Um, we do a lot internationally, too, which you can, again, talk to Kristen, who's here. She's done some of our international programs. And that's also a great way to, one, get, get out of wherever your hometown is and go try something new and challenge yourself. But that's, again, not limited to any of our New York folks. Um, we have partnerships with Cannes, with Venice, with Rotterdam, and emerging markets all over in Brazil and Goa and all sorts of interesting places. And all you need to do is be a member and apply. So, you know, I think... We do a lot with 11 people, but certainly, you know, our biggest goal is to make sure that it's not just New York. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that you uh, reaffirmed the fact that cinema is not dead, uh, like painting uh, <laughs> is hopefully not dead. Um, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the premise that doing web-based work or doing distribution work that's different than the mainstream cinema or even independent cinema is somehow just as good and, and just as enriching. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe in particular, if you could talk about your the projects that you've seen through the pipeline that maybe can express things in a way that usually gets beaten out or censored out or drilled out by the time it reaches a, a screen. Totally. Two really good questions. I'll try and unload the first one. Um, we just started doing web series last year. And our friends at Sundance just started doing web series and TV last year. And I think what's interesting is that we're finding people that are starting with web series and that they want to keep making also, you know, maybe that trajectory is towards TV, maybe it's towards film, maybe it's just making short form content and making something new. But that very much they believe in their stories and their characters and their worlds deeply. And some of them have, you know, set design background or costume, you know, they, they look good. Like they're not, you know, not everything is like, you know, a janky cat video. And there's room in the world for that too for all you cat lovers. But it's, people just don't have the means, whether those are financial means or resources or maybe their, you know, smaller town doesn't have a film society or doesn't even have a beautiful room like this. And in order to express themselves, they need to make something that isn't going to go on the big screen, right? But it is a means to an end. I mean, make no doubt about it that people making web series are not just doing it in their Nana's basement for fun. Like They want to do it to move themselves forward. Um, and I think that that's the thing that I'm seeing most of all is that maybe somebody has a day job in X but wants to be a filmmaker. Or they're making a television series and have made television for years but have no idea how to get into independent cinema. So it's really just breaking down some of that stigma and that's on like an agency level on down to just our own like I don't want to watch anything on my iPad I just don't like I like it big I like the sound good like and that's not bad but it's more about the opportunities given and the voices heard as a starting point than about how we consume it and there's 
two really great examples that I'll use. One is um, called Middle American, and it's a very high-end comedy web series that is raunchy and funny and strange and totally original. And I believe, I'm going to screw this up, but it was either shot in Nebraska or you know, someplace like, or Idaho. It's like one of those two that like, you know, nobody, nobody's going to take that call, right? Like they're just like, that is fabulous. Good on you. Call me when you move to LA. So we took it and it's funny as hell and it's dirty. And I'm not sure that people would touch it with a 10 foot pole, but we actually are now starting to do theatrical screenings of the web series that we're supporting so that there is a community, a physical community that comes and for those that don't want to do this and look at their seven episodes and binge watch, they can come and they can see it. And the quality is good enough that they actually could do that. Um, the second is a film called um, Zero Point, uh, sorry, uh, it started as a film, but they now make it, made it into a TV series called um, Zero Point. And these are two guys from Idaho, again, um, and they're super smart. And they made an hour-long web series, and they want th with the goal of television. Whereas our, our other friend made it just to make it and be a comedic voice and see where it leads her. And they've gotten into every film festival, TV festival. Like they're blowing up because people just see them as talent. They're like, "Wow, I can't wait to either see the rest of the series or what they're going to do next," because they have such an original voice. So I think that's the first part of your question is just like. People need to make work. There's a lot of people who talk about it, but not a lot of people who do it. So I think that it allows people a, a different chance. And then remind me of the, the kind of part deux. Uh, no, I mean, that, that part deux was really just about uh, examples of, of success that can happen on the smaller scale that maybe can't happen on the bigger scale. Totally. I mean, broad, you know, the, the obvious ones are broad city, high maintenance, the slope, which I talked about. You know, those are the ones that are the dreams. Um, awkward black girl, like those are the ones everybody's just like, this is fabulous. But it has to be pretty original. It has to be pretty great, kind of to transcend the crappy quality or to transcend the fact that most people are going to be doing this. And make no mistake, like we all probably in here are like over the age of 25, most of us. Everybody under the age of 25, they don't care. They don't care what screen it's on. They just don't. And and you know, there's always going to be cinephiles, and there's always going to be people that. You know, want, but but less and less. They just want to to check out great stories. Yeah. Um, hi. I'm one of the guys that you mentioned that has the pile of halos of cameras that I'm developing and shooting. And that, in addition to all the technical problems that come up with shooting for VR, the distribution part of it is uh, unknown. And I'm curious what you're seeing as far as proposals where. There, it's not yet known how people are even going to consume this. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a, you know, it's growing very quickly, yeah. and obviously we're pushing forward and, and assuming that there will be a way at the end. Yeah, <laughs> made out of cardboard, no less. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you seeing at IFP? Or what kind of proposals, and, and how are people packaging that? Because that's unusual in a whole variety of ways. Totally. I think. You know, the first thing is that people on the film side are very hungry to understand it technically, of just, you know, from the script on up. Like, it, it's a challenge to them of how do you write something that is immersive? How do you use how many ever cameras are on your halo to actually, you know, work with your cinematographer? Those conversations the same or are they different? How does that work with sound, with music? So I think taking it down a notch. First is just this, there, there's a curiosity and then there's a doing. And I think most people are very curious rather than skeptical. They're very curious, but they just need some leadership and some guidance on how does it work. So that's kind of tier A. Tier B is I think that the, most of the talk we've been hearing about our office is this idea of using VR as empathetic. So this whole notion that Whereas there's a separation of self when you're sitting in your bathroom watching high maintenance, when you're here in a beautiful cinema with good sound, you're in a room, make no doubt about it. You're in a space and a place. Whereas you can use different senses, for lack of a better way to put it, and, and you can use different techniques to engage people as like physical human beings that is a very different, different feeling than sitting in a cinema. And I must say, like I, I just got introduced to all this stuff maybe last November, and I was blown away. I, it was it was very different, and I've I've done the wingding stuff where they you know you literally just swap bodies and the stuff they're doing with MIT. I've done the stuff where you're in Syria and there's the hairy guy 
breathing down your neck and you feel like you're in Syria because, and then you actually care. You're like, oh my God, I am in a refugee camp and this sucks. Like this sucks in a very different way than watching PBS or talking to my really well-educated friend about what's going on in the region. Like it's a very different experience. So I think that whether it's you guys or other smart people coming together first to get the creatives excited and then to figure out ways where we can make it more populist and make it more accessible, that's gonna take time. But if you have people telling good stories, one or two of those will hit and then it will actually, I think, generate more people to figure out how do I use my current phone and this cardboard or how do I use a cheaper model of that current phone with headsets and it becomes something that will that will take on a life of its own but I think that as with most movements it's going to take those creative voices to kind of amplify the tech and the scary you know I the I don't knows of it all and you have people that are submitting proposals to, to, to develop projects I'm yeah. creative but I've been forced to spend a year being technical just yeah. to build the equipment and the editing the process and yeah. all of that just because I want to get to telling the story, but this, that stuff doesn't exist. So are you supporting any of that? Okay. We're, we're, we're getting ready to, yeah. So we have a couple folks in our incubator that are making that kind of work. We work, um, you know, we, we're working with a couple of other interesting and interested parties to figure this stuff out, and I think everyone is. I mean, I think everybody is just trying to figure out how to make it accessible and not not um, an impediment, the technology and the, the process not an impediment. And that's gonna, that's really gonna take time because, again, there is no one path. There is no like, oh, well, just put the halo on and go like this. Like, it doesn't work like that. Probably time for like one more question. Sure, hi. Hi, well, just sort of dovetailing on this conversation, which jumped out when you said convergence, and now we are truly, I went to NYU as well. Awesome. From the um, coming out of children's museums and interactive cool. learning and wanting to bring those interactive learning, uh, hands-on learning and experiential learning into the media world. Cool. So I did education in media. Okay. And at that time, the program was called Education Communications and Technology. Okay. But we were, I came out of Frog Design, and we talked about Convergence in 99. And yep. it's actually here now, or getting, get, coming here. So I'm interested also in the same type of, from a learning, from an educational perspective, I've been drawn to documentaries and done some work in that, and obviously I've been doing exhibit design. Yeah. So wanting to bring that out and bring film into that more. So if we're interested in talking to you guys yeah. and helping to, to make that happen? Is there a programming sort of uh, vertical or a little, a little bit? Um, you know, just to, to go very quickly. So this big giant media space, which we all like laugh that in 10 years is going to be a Prada store just because it's like edgy and on the edge of town and you know, it's, there's cobblestone streets and smoke. It's crazy. But all to say we have an interactive gallery and, and where both immersive um, and kind of video take place, but also on weekends, kids classes and different programs for animation for kids. Um, we have an incubator for talent. And so, again, that could be a filmmaker uh, that's in town for a few weeks or months that just needs a space and a place to, to create and, and kind of have that, that home base. Or it could be somebody making VR um, and tech testing equipment. It could be Playmatics, which is the, the gaming company that makes all the stuff for Dexter, the old show Dexter, and all the interstitials and the crazy games that they do. But we curate it. It's not a co-working space. So it's not something where you've got $400 burning a hole in your pocket and there's an empty seat. It's really about this whole idea of what you're saying is having the three of you that are sitting there together right now, sitting together in the space too, and being able to both kind of casually bump into each other in the bathroom, all the way to there's certain strands of programming and ideas and classes and things going on that you can kind of curate yourself. But it's really putting the curation back in the hands of the creators as opposed to all of us coming up with 60,000 programs that we think are cool. We do, and we kind of, again, use it as a catalyst or a, a starting point for then t uh, the feedback and the suggestions either on the film. And right now we do have still strictly a very filmic side, and we always will. That's never going away. But we have all sorts of opportunities so that our filmmakers or however people self-identify can find others outside of their circle and also sustain long term. So be in touch. Cool, yeah. Awesome. I know, right? <laughs> You're ahead of your time. Everyone, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here.